you very much, Premier, for that very interesting and uh, broad-ranging discussion. So I get the first question because I have the microphone while everyone else thinks of uh, their questions. You spoke about um, having the courage to change and meeting change head-on. And you spoke about large challenges that exist in uh, both South Australia and the nation. What are you doing to influence your peers, so your other state premiers and the federal government, to actually bring about positive change from what you've learnt in South Australia to bring about positive change for the rest of Australia? Well, really trying to tell the story I just told about um, how I think people are feeling deeply uncertain about their future and uh, the fact that we do have this opportunity. I mean, COAGs traditionally have been uh, those things where the Prime Minister is pretty keen to just get out of there without causing any trouble, especially if, you know, with the larger number of Labor states there. And I think something changed at the last COAG meeting. I think there was a shared perspective that um, we could be a little bit more ambitious than that. So I think the fact that we're having a retreat is an example that um, uh, at least the leaders of the, the states and territories and the Prime Minister do believe that, um, that, that something can be achieved in the nature of a breakthrough in relation to the way in which the Federation functions. So I, I, think, we've, I think we've persuaded people about that. I think it, it will require a degree of bravery to take the next step. But we are... This is an unprecedented gathering um, and I have high hopes for it. Um, and in terms of that, what are three things, if you could only put it down to three things, that the rest of the country can learn from South Australia's story, what would those three things be for you? Um, well, um, I suppose to be specific, in relation to health, which is, you know, the single... If you wanted to strip it down and talk about one thing, of the $80 billion cut, the lion's share of it is health... And in terms of the growth of public expenditures, it's the thing that's likely to consume all of us unless we are able to grapple with it. Uh, we've just been through what we think has been a very successful, but it was a, a bit of a nerve-wracking exercise. We decided to embark on a transforming our healthcare system process. Um, the thing that we learnt is that... Um, if you don't take clinicians with you in terms of healthcare reform, it's likely to be unsuccessful. So we began with uh, engaging the clinicians in a very substantial exercise of measuring everything about our public hospital system. And then we looked objectively at that data and then we created um, about 290 clinical standards and we worked out we weren't meeting 52 of them and then we designed a response to those... Uh, those 52 we weren't meeting, and that ended up coming up with some quite uh, politically difficult things, like the rationalisation of emergency services, the closing of a hospital, uh, the closing of a repatriation hospital in the 100 years since Gallipoli, which some people might say was slightly crazy, but that's what it threw up. That's the answer it threw up, so we paid proper respect for that, and we've, we argued the case. But we could not have got anywhere without the clinicians. Uh, we had clinical leaders in each of those areas and they led the process and they're driving the reform. So that's, that's something I think we can share with the nation about what we've learned about the reform process. Thank you. What questions do we have from the floor? There are some microphones around. There's a hand up at the back. So please just state your name and where you're from. Sure. You. Um, Michael Knox, Morgan's Financial. I, I, I clearly didn't understand one of the things you were saying there. You talked about uh, raising $3.4 by uh, putting GST on financial institutions. But financial institutions, like, like all other uh, service sectors, already pay GST. Uh, so... Please explain how you can raise uh, additional money from businesses that already uh, pay the tax that you're, that you're uh, 
was suggesting be levied? I think it's generally accepted that financial services are not taxed in the same way. I think they, it's treated as, um, uh, it flows through in a sense. So the particular financial service that's provided by a bank uh, to a, um, to a uh, anybody that they're associated with, the, uh, the, the lender, uh, in the increment of, of profit or the increment of service, however that's calculated, does not have a GST charge to it. That's the basis on which a financial services element of the GST uh, would be considered. Now, um, it, it's, it is applied in some countries, although not commonly in countries that have goods and services tax, but it is a sector of the economy which is a service which does not attract the GST. And it could, and it wouldn't be regressive. Thank you. Premier, Megan Motto from Consult Australia, and I'd like to first of all start by congratulating you on the vision and leadership that you've shown this week. Uh, from Consult Australia's perspective, we've had a particular success in uh, engaging with the South Australian Government through the Office of the Industry Advocate, and I was wondering whether you'd comment to the audience tonight why you set that position up in the first place and what success you've seen through that position. Yeah, the Industry Participation Advocate is uh, a body set up to assist small uh, local companies to get their fair share of uh, state government procurement. Um, it doesn't do this in a way which uh, discriminates against interstate or overseas companies, but um, sometimes the way in which government procures can accidentally um, make it harder for local companies. Uh, which is obviously the last thing any um, state government would want to do. So the way in which uh, projects are bundled up, the way in which companies can perhaps partner with other larger companies so that they can be part of a consortium, uh, are all ways in which you can maximise the amount of local component uh, for um, uh, particular uh, projects. So that's essentially the, uh, the, the model. Thank you. Other questions? While we're waiting for another question, I get to ask you another one, uh, Premier. So what advice do you have for young people who want to join politics? What advice would you give them? Because we've heard a lot today, and most of the feedback that I've had is from everyone saying, why would I leave business and join politics? Why would I do that? And last week, or a few weeks ago, we had Gillian Triggs, Professor Gillian Triggs over in South Australia, and she spoke about um, the importance of understanding the role of politics early on in your career, because when you get to later on, if you don't understand it and if you don't work with it, you actually can't get things done. So what advice do you have for us? Um, well, the first thing uh, I'd say is that I think politics is the highest calling. I think, it's, I think it's the most magnificent profession you could ever be involved on. The idea of serving your fellow citizens and wanting to make the world a better place for them, I think is the highest calling that there is. And um, not that it's generally seen that way. We're sort of ranked somewhere around near... Well, I won't denigrate some other fine profession, but uh, we're not highly regarded, and I think that's a sad thing. So I'd say, I'd say to a young person, it is a magnificent uh, profession and, and a, a really worthy um, object. Uh, the other thing I'd say to them, though, is you, you need to know why you're doing it. Not what you're going to do or how you're going to do it, but why are you doing it? And I don't think enough politicians ask themselves that question. And... Um, you know, most spectacularly was played out with Mal Meninga. You remember, that's that famous Mal Meninga interview where somebody asked, everybody makes fun of Mal about that, but they asked him the question, they said, Mal, why are you doing this? And he didn't know. And, uh, uh, and then it was spectacularly, I think his candidature lasted sort of 60 seconds. It's the fastest or the shortest candidature in the history of politics. But... It, and it was a bit funny for that reason, but it's actually a bit serious because a lot of people don't ask themselves that question. And you don't have to just ask yourself that question at the beginning. You have to ask yourself that question all through your career because survival can take over and you can depart from why you decided you were involved in politics. So it's very important to keep that steadily in mind. So why do you do it, Premier? 
Well, I got involved because I, I hate injustice and I love justice. I, I, I like representing people and making sure that, um, you know, wrongs are righted. Um, it's, I was a Labor lawyer and uh, I've always represented people who um, I felt have been harshly dealt with and um, that's my motivation in, in getting involved in politics is to... Um, is to look after people in that way. Thank you. That's a good answer to the question. Uh, Stephen. Uh, Premier, in your, uh, in your comments, you uh, raised the issue of leadership, or lack thereof, uh, in your impression of uh, the current political scene in Australia. Uh, in a personal view, I think... Uh, what we are seeing with Premier Baird in New South Wales, what we're seeing with you in South Australia, and I think uh, the signs in, uh, in Victoria with Premier Andrews, um, is a commitment of, of leadership and setting particular directions for the states. With that in mind, and given that you're going into a retreat shortly with the Prime Minister, um, what advice are you going to be giving him, uh, or what advice would you give the nation generally about the need for leadership, and how would you describe what that leadership could look like, should look like, for Australia? Well, I think it gets back to pretty basic things. People uh, want, want to be safe and secure. Of course, that's a minimum basic responsibility, but they also want to know what the future looks like for themselves and their families in terms of a job. They want to be able to be treated in a hospital where they're sick. They want a good education for their kids, and they want to be cared for in their age. Um, these, these basic um, senses of security, I think people are feeling, uh, aren't feeling at the moment. And I think it's incumbent on us when we leave that retreat for us to, uh, to make, I think, a very substantial step forward. I, I think that what's happening at the moment, if you look at the Commonwealth's imperatives at the moment, they're they're actually intruding on what were traditionally regarded as state imperatives, health, education, infrastructure, all of these things that were traditionally the, the province of the states and territories and are receiving a, a, quite a lot of attention from the Commonwealth. Now, um, I think there's a respectable argument that goes that the Commonwealth, the big Commonwealth reforms um, are largely uh, have been dealt with, you know, whether it's reform to the financial markets, reform to the product markets, the freeing up of trade, uh, even reforms to the industrial relations system. I mean, there's fundamentally, uh, I mean, plus or minus some tinkering around the edges, those big reform agendas are spent. They're largely within the province of the states and territories. So what we need is a Commonwealth that, rather than telling us that we should be teaching phonics and, you know, raising up, raising a sort of school flag, uh, you know, the Australian flag up, up a school pole and having chaplains, which is sort of an intrusion into the state imperatives around education. We need, I think, a new set of functional and financial relations between the Commonwealth and the state so the states can actually get on with these things. You look at the health, education, infrastructure. These are the things around which we have been bluing for a very long period of time. In almost every, every state in the nation has these boundary disputes on these issues. These are the areas that the Harper Review says are the areas of reform which are ripe for reform. I don't necessarily subscribe to his solutions, which are all very market-based, but he says the same thing, that these are the areas of reform that we should be attending to as the nation. This is the next province of productivity growth, is towns and cities within the province and all the service systems around those towns and cities, which is principally the province of states and territories. So um, I don't want to sh cheekily suggest that uh, it, we should go back to the old days where the Premier's invited the Commonwealth to come to the Premier's um, <laughs> meetings, but it would be good if we recalibrated the relationship so the Commonwealth weren't just imposing you know, measures from on high and us having to cope with the, the consequences of that. You know, a really powerful example was the $80 billion cut. You can't imagine any federation that you could design that can effectively function if two levels of government don't keep their agreements with each other. So we do need a new deal with uh, the Commonwealth. I think this is heading on a positive trajectory. 
I've tried not to be too inflammatory with my criticism of the Commonwealth because I do want to reach a constructive settlement at the retreat and I hope that uh, that's where we go. Thank you. Before we, we've got one over there. Uh, good evening, Premier. Uh, Emil Bollengaita from Carnegie Mellon University, Australia. As you know, we are uh, now in our ninth year in, in Adelaide and uh, we're very excited to be in Adelaide as one of the two international universities in Australia. Excited because uh, you've outlined a, a very dynamic vision of, uh, of what South Australia would like to be uh, going forward under your leadership, a vision that includes uh, uh, emphasis on information technology and energy innovation, uh, two areas where the university is uh, very strong at. Uh, and you've pursued a very uh, active international engagement as well, which is very helpful for the international education sector. My question really is about where you see are the major risks to, to the uh, uh, approaches to the attainment of this vision and, and how do you see uh, South Australia uh, you, under your government, uh, under your leadership addressing those risks? Thank you. Well, I think in relation to climate change, which is the particular um, topic we, we addressed and, and in particular the carbon neutral city, I think many of the levers are actually reside with the, uh, with the states and territories. If you look at you know, the drivers for, uh, for uh, carbon emissions, they're usually utilities, um, energy systems, um, transport systems, uh, waste systems, the way cities operate transport systems. Um, you know, we, we have many of the levers there and this is one thing that's being, I think, recognised in the talks in the lead up to Paris this year is that subnational governments are going to be uh, playing a much more central role in the climate change discussions uh, that exist. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, we've got now the renewable energy target's been settled, so that risk has been taken, that particular risk has been taken off the table. Um, you know, there's, there's no reason why states and territories can't go this alone. I mean, carbon emissions don't know, you know, state or, or a country boundaries. There's no reason why we couldn't involve ourselves in some of the international arrangements uh, which are necessary to take the next step. Thank you. Premier, it's Ross Wamersley from SACOS here. Um, my question, I'm not quite sure how to frame it, but essentially one of the things that I hear people saying is that they're sick of the federal and state governments fighting with each other and bickering over, over issues to do with who's responsible for what and um, where the funding's coming from and all of those kinds of things. And I guess you've led a charge and a fairly fierce charge back at the federal government about what's going on in South Australia and the, the situation. How is the summit the only mechanism that we have to actually get those relationships back into some sort of a situation where we actually get a functional federation and a, and a joined up attempt to support states right across all of the states and territories? Look, I, I, mean, I think um, there are some senses in which we're just joined at the hip. I don't think you can, the healthcare system's a classic example. I mean, if we've got public hospitals and the Commonwealth has the GP system, the Commonwealth has the aged care system uh, and elements of the disability services system, then the, we have public hospitals and they have the entry points through GPs and the exit points through aged care. It's hard to imagine, unless you're going to hand over public hospitals to the Commonwealth, uh, how you could design a system that doesn't involve collaboration. So I don't think, so I don't think the solution is going to necessarily, in all cases, is going to come through some sharper lines. And the Prime Minister's fond of saying, let's be sovereign in our own sphere. That's a particular philosophical view about federation, which is, um, which is, you know, it does exist in some parts of the world, although it's not the commonly used type of federation. More common types of federation are cooperative federalism, and I think that's probably closest to the type of system that we have. So I think there's a sense in which we're always going to have to uh, collaborate and we can't get out of each other's way in any relevant sense. I think that the, the reason why there is squabbling 
and that's because there hasn't been any um, persuasive shared vision for the future. I mean, if there's a really powerful vision which is articulated, um, it becomes impossible for people to do anything other than cooperate in it. If it's that persuasive and, and people are buying into it, then opposition just disappears. I think the real... I, I don't think there's anything intrinsically about people misbehaving or being more or less cooperative. I think it's about the quality of the vision. And if it can be a shared vision for the future, then obviously you're going to have... Uh, that there'll be, there'll be more support for it. Um, look, I, I do hope, though, that this, this uh, retreat is a circuit breaker. Hopefully we can reach some shared vision for the future of the country, and, uh, but, but we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, so uh, um, we'll see what happens. Thank you. It's the last question from Ian Sterling. Uh, Premier, you recently led a, uh, a large delegation to China of, I think, over 220 people. Can you give us a bit of an, uh, an insight into, because that's a massive delegation, I think it, the largest ever from South Australia, uh, a, a bit of an insight into the opportunities that uh, you came across? It is. It was the largest delegation we took to uh, anywhere, but we took it to China and in particular to Shandong province. Shandong is uh, a sister state for South Australia. Uh, it also happens to be the third largest economy in, in China and um, there's 100, about 100 million people. So we're very fortunate that 30 years ago... Uh, next year, uh, we established that sister-state relationship. Um, and we, we find China, you know, too big to consume for a small state, so we've deliberately tried to focus our effort on one state. And we've built on a very strong cultural, uh, shared cultural exchange, arts, uh, students, uh, species of aid, where we've supported them, sporting and other uh, communication. Uh, last year, we showcased um, Shandong in our Oz Asia Festival, which is the largest cultural Asian festival in the nation. And we've really built up deep relationships and have, have kept going back. So uh, it's got a very strong basis. Um, we um, obviously the the areas that um, that have that have been, I think, very prospective for us are food and wine, uh, health industries. Uh, overseas students, of course, and uh, international tourism, uh, but also our, our mining and resources sector. Um, we've, we had um, very substantial connections that were developed between a number of businesses in South Australia and their counterparts in Shandong. And as you'd appreciate, um, government is a very big deal in, in Shandong, so the introduction of a state government to the counterpart provincial government there and bringing a group of businesses was a, a platform which allowed them to get access to leaders in their counterpart businesses that they couldn't get if they travelled there by themselves. So many of the businesses came away with very high-level agreements and uh, um, it was there were some very spectacular results out of what was a, a week-long trade mission uh, to Shandong province. Thank you. That brings a close to the question. So I'd like to invite Mr Mark Irwin, CEO of Circo Asia Pacific, to propose the vote of thanks.